Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 28 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. I am excited you could join me today because we have an exciting episode. Today, we are going to explore one of my favorite topics in early 19th century United States history, the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal stands as one of the largest commercial and engineering projects of the 19th century, and in my opinion, as one of the most exciting projects in all of United States and New York State history. Now, my dissertation and book project have allowed me to study how the Erie Canal impacted the eastern New York cities of Schenectady, Albany, and Troy. The squabbling that takes place between Albany and Troy as they vie to be the premier Hudson River port for Erie Canal traffic I I just find this rivalry fascinating because the competition between Albany and Troy led to the construction of new roads, better, faster, bigger, and more luxurious steamboats, grand hotels, and to the introduction of one of the first passenger railways in the United States, the Hudson and Mohawk Railroad. And that railroad helped passengers bypass the busiest and slowest part of the Erie Canal the 27 locks that stood between Albany and Schenectady. Now, rather than spend 24 hours waiting to travel around these locks or spending three to four hours traveling to Schenectady by stagecoach, Erie Canal passengers could embark on the Hudson and Mohawk Railroad and reach Schenectady in one hour and 45 minutes. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're familiar with the geography, you know that you can hop in your car and travel to Schenectady from Albany in about 20 to 30 minutes. But in the early 19th century, one hour and 45 minutes was incredibly fast. So that was a really exciting development. Of course, my most fascinating story is probably that of New York Congressman George Tibbetts of Troy. He tried to make Troy the premier port by getting Boston investors to build a canal from Boston to Troy, a route that would have involved carrying canal passengers over the Berkshire Mountains. Now, ultimately, Tibbetts was not successful, so Albany wins the premier commercial port on the Hudson River. But as you can tell, this is just a really fascinating story. And today, Janice Fontanella of the Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site is going to lead us on an exploration of the Erie Canal and how it was built. In today's episode, Janice reveals why New York State built a 363-mile-long canal between the Hudson River and Lake Erie, how laborers built the Erie Canal and the technological innovations that came out of its construction, and how the Erie Canal impacted the economy, demography, and geography of both New York State and the United States. So I hope you're ready for this historical adventure. Let's get it underway. And please be sure to watch your head as this episode may take us under some low bridges. Now allow me to introduce you to Janice Fontanella and the Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Janice Fontanella is the site manager of Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site in Fort Hunter, New York. Also known as the Erie Canal National Landmark, Schoharie Crossing preserves and interprets the history of the Erie Canal, one of the largest commercial and engineering projects of the 19th century. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Janice. Thank you so much, Liz. So New York is a really big state. Could you just tell us about where Fort Hunter is in the state? Fort Hunter is about 40 miles west of Albany. Uh, it's pretty much a straight line from Albany. It's a little, it's close to Amsterdam, New York, if anybody's familiar with that town. Um, it's about five miles west of Amsterdam. And it's right on the Mohawk River, right where the Schoharie Creek enters the Mohawk River. Oh, that seems like a really good placement. 
It is a great placement, and my office looks out on both those bodies of water, and it's really beautiful here. Would you tell us a bit about yourself and what types of work you do as site manager of Schoharie Crossing? Well, in terms of myself, um, I really love the outdoors and I really love history. And Schoharie Crossing is a combination platter of those two loves, so it's a perfect place for me. I'm not, I don't feel trapped or confined by a historic building. I've got the whole outdoors as the canvas of the history here at Schoharie Crossing. And in terms of, of what we do here, uh, Schoharie Crossing covers about 250 acres, and we have 10 buildings. So a lot of what we do, we're very small staff, a lot of what we do is maintenance work to keep the stuff looking good and in good repair for folks who come to visit us. More directly, I'm involved in the interpretation and the special programs that we do here. We have tours and we talk to school groups and we have go out to schools and we go out to libraries and we do all kinds of special events. We do just about anything that we can come up with to seduce people into coming to Schoharie Crossing and appreciating the history and the nature that we have here. If I can get people here and get get a little spark of interest in them and the history and sort of make them committed to preserving the history or make them committed to the natural elements of the site. I feel like I'm doing a great job. All right. Well, let's meet your challenge. Seduce us, Janice. Tell us what we might find when we visit the Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site. Schoharie Crossing is a just about the best place to see the historic Erie Canal. The Erie Canal actually had three historic phases. There was the original canal, and then it was so successful that they enlarged it, and then they enlarged it a third time in the 20th century. And Schoharie Crossing is a place where you can see all three phases of the historic Erie Canal side by side. It's just about the only place where you can do that. And in addition to that, we have most of the structures that you can see on the canal now anywhere in the state. We have locks, we have a towpath, we have an aqueduct, we have a boat basin, we have a canal store, we have culverts. Uh, So we have all of the basic structures of the canal. In some cases, we actually have structures side by side from both the original and the enlarged canal. It's the only place in the state, for example, where you can see a lock from the original canal just steps away from a lock from the enlarged canal. And as I've already said, it's in a beautiful setting. We've got two rivers that go by here. And then the third sort of great thing about Schoharie Crossing is the landscape. The Erie Canal went for 363 miles across the state, but in a lot of places now, that landscape has completely changed, built over, roads have been built where the canal is. But at Schoharie Crossing, the landscape is still approximately the same. You can still see the the path of the canal. You can still see the canal prism. Um, In fact, instead of being overdeveloped the way, say, Syracuse or Rochester or other places where the canal went through, Fort Hunter is actually less developed today than it was in the canal era. So you can sort of see the scope of the canal here in a way that you can't see it in other places. So, um, and I'm not the only person to say it. Of course, I would say it because I love it here. But just about anybody, I think, would say that Schoharie Crossing is just about the best place to see the scope of the historic Erie Canal. How is it that Fort Hunter was able to preserve all of the buildings and canal features that you mentioned? Well, some of it is just good luck because uh, once the canal left here, there really was no commercial activity in Fort Hunter. So it went into a period basically of decline. So there wasn't any pressure to develop the site. But then there was also the Fort Hunter Canal Society started lobbying the state early on in the uh, early 60s to actually take active steps to preserve the site. And they were successful in interesting the state in preserving the site. And actually, Governor Rockefeller had a hand in preserving the site. And there was that whole period of being interested interested in history and setting up New York State historic sites. Uh, So there was really active local lobbying of the state to set up the Fort Hunter uh, site here. You mentioned that the Erie Canal went through three phases of building. I'd like to focus on the first phase, which was building the original canal. So can we start with why New York State sought to build the 363 mile long canal from the Hudson River, just north of Albany to Lake Erie out by Buffalo? It it is an incredible idea because at that point, New York State was largely wilderness. West of Schenectady was mostly wilderness. There were a few small towns. There wasn't anything there. Uh, But it was the logical place to build a canal. First of all, it's the only place basically in the eastern seaboard where there's a natural break in the Appalachian Mountains. So it was a logical 
geographical place to build the canal. And there was, an imp- there was a need for a connection to Great Lakes Commerce and the Atlantic Ocean. There was commerce, a little bit of commerce going on in the West. Uh, it was completely separated because of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, commerce from the West actually went down the Mississippi River to New Orleans or out the Great Lakes to from the St. Lawrence River out to Montreal. So there was really no connection between the East and the West. And the Basically, the eastern seaboard was very heavily populated, and the west was largely unpopulated, and it was a very rich area. There was rich western farmland. There were natural resources, lumber, coal, minerals. So there was a need to get people from the east out to the west to take advantage of that. And lots of folks had actually noticed that, and we're talking about it as early as, say, George Washington. When he visited New York State, he talked about a time when there would be that connection between the east and the West. Uh, Governor Morris, who was a local politician, talked about accessing the West. Uh, And then along came the War of 1812, and it was very expensive to get war materials out to Niagara. I don't know the specifics, but it cost something like $400 to get a a cannon out to the West. Uh, It was very, very expensive, and so that was a a spur to build the canal. So all of those things, it was necessary to get out to the West, and New York State stepped up to the plate and figured out how to do it. I imagine it would also be very useful once the West is settled, because then you can, you know, all the farm produce that they're producing in the West can easily be shipped to the East and out to the Atlantic Ocean. Absolutely. It was a tremendous financial boon. It gave people who were living out in the West a way to actually make a living because, as you said, they could ship their produce out to the East. Construction of the Erie Canal began on July 4th, 1817 in Rome, New York, and finished with the opening of the entire canal on October 26, 1825. So Janice, let's talk specifics about how they built the canal. Did laborers dig this famous ditch by hand or did they have animal or steam driven tools available to them? They did mostly dig it by hand. They did have animal teams, and they had like horse-drawn scrapers and horse-drawn wheelbarrows, but it was largely done by hand. So I I often ask school kids to think about what it would be like to dig a 40-foot ditch in their backyard. And so think about digging that kind of a ditch across the entire state of New York, which is largely wilderness and trees. So not only do you have to dig a ditch, but you have to clear it. Um, A team of surveyors went through the state, and they actually marked out a 60-foot area to be cleared. Uh, And then once the trees were cleared from that area, they marked out a 40-foot area where the actual canal prism itself was dug. And then it was all dug by hand. They did invent a lot of things to help them out. After you've cleared the trees, think about digging up stumps. Uh, That's a pretty hard job, even today with our modern technology. They invented a special stump puller that was operated by six men and a team of horses, and basically was a big pole on wheels that pulled the stumps out of the ground. And with this device, men, a team of men could pull out 34 stumps a day. They also invented a tree puller so that they could attach a cable to the top of a tree and attach the cable to kind of an endless screw and then just pull the tree down, which made it easier than chopping by hand with a team. So one man could take down a tree. They improved wheelbarrows. They had uh, all kinds of plows and scrapers that horses could draw. Uh, but it was, a, it was a tough job, and it was done basically by hand. Did any of these canal-developed tools, such as the stump puller and the tree puller, find their way into the wilderness to help clear the land and make it agricultural land? I don't actually know. It certainly makes sense. It was because they cleared the land. They had the 60-foot clearing. It was actually made the land accessible for the railroads further on. I don't know if they actually used those stump pullers to clear agricultural land or not. That's a question I can't answer. So what proved to be the trickiest part of constructing the Erie Canal? There were lots of tricky parts, some that you might not actually think of. One of the tricky parts was the Montezuma Swamp, which is a little bit west of Syracuse. And they actually found that in the summertime, uh, they had so much difficulty with it for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it was a swamp, and when they cleared out the muck, it would just like flow right back into the area, and it was a lot of repeated work. And they ended up actually working in the winter so they could clear the frozen ground rather than worry about the muck. But the more important problem there was malaria, and there were swarms and swarms of mosquitoes, and 
hundreds of people died from malaria, which is something we don't normally think of in New York State. Definitely not. So winter also solved that problem. Then in terms of the land uh, at either end, the level of New York, is th- the state of New York is fairly level in the center, but in the eastern and western sections of the state, there are much higher elevations. And in Lockport, there's, it's largely rock. And so that was one of the challenges. There were two miles of rock in Lockport, and they ended up digging through the rock. And they used, um, they actually blew it up. And they used black powder left over from the War of 1812. And they recruited young boys to crawl in between the cracks of the rock, place the powder, light the fuse, and then get the heck out of there so they wouldn't be blown up. And these guys were called powder monkeys, which is a familiar term now. And this is new technology. We think about people blowing up rocks now as standard behavior, but that was new. And then at Rochester, they built an 800-foot aqueduct. And west of there, towards Niagara, they built a 70-foot high embankment uh, across the Rondequoit Valley. And folks who looked at the canal that was now up 70-foot high talked about the boats seeming to travel in midair. And then at the eastern end, where there is also quite a high elevation between the level of the uh, Hudson River, around Cohoes Falls, they actually ended up building 27 locks in just about 28 canal miles. So they built a lot of locks. But then at Waterford, they built five locks over that steepest part. Uh, I think it's something like 169-foot elevation to get around. And even today, on the modern canal, the Waterford flight of five locks is still the highest lift lock in the world. It's I think something like twice as high as the actual lift from sea level to the summit on the Panama Canal. So that was quite a challenge for the the technology of the early 19th century. So those were the trickiest parts of building the canal. That's pretty amazing that there are 27 locks and like 28 canal miles because the whole canal only has 36 locks and about 32 navigable aqueducts. So could you tell us how those locks and aqueducts worked? Yep, I sure can. Um, But just let me add one thing. In fact, the uh, original canal had 83 locks. It's the contemporary canal that had the 36 locks. So those 28 locks uh, in the first part of the canal were about a third of the locks on the original canal. But technology for um, locks has been around for quite a long time. Uh, In fact, something that I find really interesting is that the technology for the contemporary locks uh, was actually developed by, developed by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and Leonardo da Vinci is from, what, the 15th century? So the technology has been around for 500 years. And he developed lock gates that are go in a slight V shape with the V pointing up toward the higher water so that the water presses against the V and keeps the lock gates from leaking. And then there are smaller gates in the bottom of each of the lock gates, and water flows in from the upper level by gravity. The water flows in, fills up the locks, and then they can open the gates. The boat goes in, close the gates, and then let the water out at the lower end, open the gates, and out the boat goes. So the locks are a way of overcoming changes in elevation in the land. And that method of locks is exactly the same method that's used uh, in locks today. It's the same, same technology that was used back in Leonardo da Vinci's day. A real Renaissance connection to New York State. Yep. And then in terms of the aqueducts that go across the canal, actually that's surprisingly tricky. Folks come to Schoharie Crossing and a lot of folks don't know what an aqueduct is or how an aqueduct works. Uh, And here at Scohead Crossing, the most obvious feature of our canal panoply of structures is the aqueduct. And the aqueduct is actually like a bridge for boats. It carried boats across the Schoharie Creek, which is a very dangerous river. Uh, And so folks could actually cross the Schoharie Creek without entering the creek at all. The boats were were taken on this boat for bridge for boats right across the Schoharie Creek. I imagine that another challenge that New York faced in building this canal may have been the politics involved of of where to begin the canal and where to end the canal. So how did the canal commissioners of New York State determine where should the eastern terminus be and which community should get the western terminus? (laughs) There were for sure a lot of politics. And there were several different routes that were considered. 
one of the routes that was considered was uh, following the Mohawk River and then the Oswego River up to Lake Erie, which in fact would have been a much shorter route. But the consideration there was that once the boats were in Lake Erie, it would be just as easy for them to go to Montreal and take that commerce to Canada. And there was a lot of competition between commerce in Canada. So that route was determined not to be as financially successful uh, as something that would be strictly in New York State. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the logical path, because of the geography of New York State, is to go that route from basically from Albany to Buffalo because of the break in the Appalachian mountain chains. Uh, Mountain chain, there's a place just a little bit west here of Schoharie Crossing called the Noses, uh, and that's the only place in the eastern seaboard where there's a natural break in the Appalachian Mountains, and that's where the Mohawk River flows through the mountains. So once it was decided that they weren't going to go up through uh, Lake Ontario, that was the natural route. But then there was a lot of discussion about whether the terminus of the canal, uh, the western terminus, was going to be Buffalo or Black Rock. And Black Rock is was at that point a small village just about two miles north of Buffalo. Now it's basically part of Buffalo, but at that point they were two communities. Buffalo was just a little teeny tiny town, and it was basically strictly politics. It was who had the better um, political skills to get that decision made. Buffalo invested a lot of money in improving their harbor to try and attract the Canal Commission to make that decision, and they did eventually uh, decide to go to Buffalo. When the canal opened on October 26, 1825, what did that mean for the people of New York State and the, and the settlers in the Old Northwest Territory? Did the canal really speed up travel time between the East and the West? Oh, man. <laughs> This is, it, it's hard to exaggerate how important the Erie Canal was. It basically transformed how the United States would develop. One, one little tiny fact, which I found very interesting before I actually get into the larger picture of that, is that people in the West, for the first time, were able to have oysters. <laughs> They reduced the travel time so much that before then, oysters would spoil before they got to Buffalo. But now with the canal, they could actually, it was quick enough to actually bring oysters to Buffalo. The travel time went from six weeks to six days. Incredible difference in travel time. And the cost of moving freight from Albany to Buffalo went from $100 a ton to approximately $10 a ton. In fact, it's, it's really hard in our 21st century time to imagine that it actually took six weeks to get from Albany to Buffalo. That's a really long time. And with the canal, it just dramatically changed it, changed it to six days. And it basically completely realigned the relationship between the regions of the country. Uh, Before exports from the Old Northwest were going down the Mississippi to New Orleans or out the Great Lakes to Montreal, as I've mentioned. And it established, because of the Erie Canal, there was now a strong connection between the New England states and New York and the Midwest. It opened up the whole Midwest for settlement. And as you mentioned, it allowed people who lived in the Midwest to bring their goods to to market in the East. Um, It solidified the national identity. There was an unbelievable increase in population in New York State. As I mentioned, Buffalo was a tiny town at that point. Um, In the 10 years after the canal was built, between 1825 and 1835, the population of Buffalo increased over 300%. The population of Rochester increased over 500%. And in fact, Rochester didn't even really exist before the Erie Canal was built. It was called the mother of cities. Most of the cities in New York State owe their their almost existence to the canal. Lots of cities in New York State have the word port attached to their name, Brockport, Spencerport, Port Byron, Weedsport, Fairport, um, all because of the canal. Uh, It made New York City the principal port in the nation. It also was responsible in some part for other cities outside of New York State, Cleveland, uh, even Chicago, all got a boost because of the Erie Canal. It's just hard to overestimate uh, its impact. Even today, 75% of the population of New York lives within two miles of the New York State Canal system. So even today, it has an importance, although not the direct kind of financial importance uh, it did in the 19th century. 
One of the things that surprised me in my own research about the post-revolution New England migration into New York State was, you know, in our in my mind, the best time to move would be spring. But that was the worst time to move in the late 18th and early 19th centuries because the roads were just so muddy and none of them had been cleared. And so I can imagine that the canal really facilitated the move west. And you've actually shown that by pointing out all those population increase figures for us. So thank you. Yeah, I've read, as you probably you have, the sort of commentary of people trying to travel on those roads, muddy, and they were covered with logs and bumpy and incredibly dusty in the summer. And yeah, just a mess. So what was it like to travel along the Erie Canal? Can we talk about the canal boats? Like how big were they? What kinds of accommodations did they have on board? And how were they powered? Um, they were powered by m- mules and horses. The, well, there were steam boats that were developed pretty early on in the uh, 19th century, but there was actually a speed limit on the canal of four miles an hour, uh, and steamboats c- can go much faster than that. And the reason for the speed limit was because the boats going faster than that would create a big wake, and that would basically destroy the banks of the canal. So uh, most of the boats were powered by animal power. The locks on the uh, original canal were 90 feet by 15 feet, and the boats were just slightly smaller than that. You wanted as much boat as you could have that would fit through the lock. So the canal boats themselves were uh, in the range of 60 feet by 70 feet. And the canal itself was not that deep. It was only four feet deep. So the draft of these barges was like three and a half feet. There were basically three kinds of boats. There were packet boats, which carried passengers. And there were freight boats, which carried freight. And then there were line boats, which carried a little bit of each. Uh, And as I mentioned, there was a speed limit, so they went um, fairly slowly, although still a heck of a lot faster than going on the roads. Uh, And they were horse-drawn. And the mules, a lot of the boats were family-owned, so they had had a team of mules that would live on the boat uh, and a team of mules that would be working, and they'd switch the mules every, oh, 15 miles or so. Uh, There's lots of commentaries about passengers traveling on the canal, and they talk about how pleasant it was to be floating along the canal, sitting on the boats, watching the, the landscape go by. But in the evenings when they went inside to sleep, uh, you get a completely different kind of commentary. They were very, very crowded, noisy, smelly. There were bunks that were three high. Uh, sometimes the bunks collapsed and fell on each other. One a commentator talks about folks being packed in the packet boats like pigs in a Cincinnati pork warehouse, and it was completely unpleasant. And the passenger traffic on the canal is what we sort of think of in the romantic imagination of the canal. But in fact, there was not that much passenger traffic on the canal. That was a novelty item, and at first it was the quickest way to go. But the railroads came along pretty quickly, and the canal traffic was pretty much freight traffic after about, oh, the 1830s or 40s. Speaking of railroad traffic, Rosa would like to know how the Erie Canal coped with the introduction of the railroad into New York State and about when that introduction happened. The introduction of railroads in New York State actually happened pretty quickly. The first railroads were in New York State in the 1830s. In fact, the first successful steam engine running a regular scheduled route between Albany and Schenectady was in 1831. That was the Hudson and Mohawk Railroad. And actually, that was, did not really impact the Erie Canal all that much because most passengers started, if you were going to be a passenger on the Erie Canal, you started your trip in Schenectady because it was much quicker to go either by uh, railroad or by carriage to get to Schenectady because we've already mentioned there were 27 locks between Albany and Schenectady. So it took a long time. So most people started in Schenectady. But after that, the railroads became more and more successful and more and more extensive. And the freight tonnage on the railroads actually exceeded the freight tonnage on the canal by 1868. And the peak freight traffic on the canal happened in 1872, shortly after that. And after that, the freight traffic on the canal started to diminish. But for some freight, it was still 
um, cheaper to ship by canal rather than railroads. So there was still actually freight traffic on the canal right up into the 20th century. Some of the less successful lateral, lateral canals were abandoned. Uh, but in the 20th century, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was governor of New York, and he actually commissioned a group to study whether it was worthwhile enlarging the canal. And they determined that there was still cheaper to transport some goods on the canal rather than the railroad, and they advocated enlarging the canal. And at that point, they created the New York State Barge Canal, and that was successful in terms of freight up until the 1950s. The real, in addition to the railroads, the real thing that was the death knell for the Erie Canal was the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, it could have bigger ships, and so by the end of the 1950s, there was virtually no freight on the Erie Canal. In grade school, I learned to sing this song called the Erie Canal. It involved a mule named Sal, 15 miles along the Erie Canal, and shouts of, low bridge, everybody down. Does that song have any accuracy? And if so, why are there so many low bridges along the Erie Canal? It's completely accurate. And there are so many bridges along the canal because the canal actually went through a lot of a lot of people's properties, uh, farm fields. It separated people's farm fields, so they needed to get from one side of their field to the other. And so bridges were built to accommodate the landowners. And the less materials that you can use, the cheaper the bridge is, and it's cheaper to build a low bridge rather than a high bridge. So they built the bridges uh, low as low as they could to let the boats underneath. So anybody sitting on top of the boat would be knocked off if they went under a bridge. So the passengers who were you know, lounging, enjoying their time on top of the deck of the canal boat, had to be alert for somebody telling them there was a bridge coming or they'd be knocked off into the water. Uh, in fact, there are actual stories of people being hit hard enough that they died. There were actually deaths mm. that occurred because of people being hit by bridges if they didn't get down quick enough. So lots and lots of bridges, I think. I don't know how many, but I think I've heard the number, more than 300 bridges along the canal. So you had to pay attention bumped heads is not something we have with our romantic picture of what it would have been like to travel along the Erie Canal. No, not true at all. I have another listener question for you. James would like to know about the role DeWitt Clinton played in the construction of the Erie Canal. So before you answer that question specifically, could you also tell us who DeWitt Clinton was and about his involvement in the Erie Canal project? Um, DeWitt Clinton was a New York State politician. He had a lot of different official roles. He was the mayor of New York City. He was a New York State senator. Uh, he was governor. He was actually a presidential candidate. Uh, in terms of the Erie Canal, he was um, made a member of the Canal Commission. And we wouldn't actually ha probably have the Erie Canal, but for DeWitt Clinton, he was a tireless advocate for the canal. He thought it was a really great idea. He did a number of speaking tours promoting the canal. And, you know, now we know that the canal was a good idea. Now we know we've talked about how successful it was and how commercially successful and how great it was economically speaking for the state. But when it was built, it was thought as sort of a crazy idea. It was largely through the wilderness. As you've said a couple times, it was 363 miles, which made it by far, by far, the longest canal in the country. Before the Erie Canal was built, the longest canal in the country was the Middlesex Canal, which was 26 miles. It was uh, in the area of Boston, which is a highly developed area. So to think of building a canal in the wilderness by hand for 363 miles was thought of as crazy. Uh, in fact, the New York delegation went to see if they could get federal funding for the canal. They went to Thomas Jefferson, who we normally think of as kind of a visionary guy. And when Thomas Jefferson was asked to help fund the Erie Canal, his comment was that the idea was little short of madness. He said, maybe in a hundred years, but right now the idea is madness. So it was a crazy idea. And DeWitt Clinton um, was ceaseless in advocating for it, and he was successful. He finally convinced the New York State legislature to, legislature to vote money for the canal, and off they went. This conversation topic is actually perfect for our transition into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently, or if someone had acted differently. <laughs> The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. 
And your answer is perfect for the time warp, Janice, because I wanted to ask you about the bonus bill of 1817. You mentioned that New York had approached Thomas Jefferson about the canal. He thinks it's this crazy idea. After the War of 1812, many in Congress thought, you know, internal improvements is a great idea. You know, not only could we have the Erie Canal, but we could have lots of roads and other canals and things to facilitate travel. So they passed this 1817 bonus bill, and that contained all the funding for these internal improvements. But President James Madison decided that the Constitution did not grant the federal government authority to invest in internal improvements. So he vetoed the bill. So my time warp question to you is, in your opinion, what might have happened if President James Madison had not vetoed the bonus bill of 1817? Do you think New York State still would have built the Erie Canal along the same route? And would the substantial investment in nationwide internal improvements have affected the success of the canal? That's a pretty interesting question. I think that, yes, it would have definitely been built along the same route because Geographically speaking, it's the logical and really only place, uh, at least in the Northeast, for a canal. But the financial stuff might have been quite a bit different. The Because New York State built the canal with state funds, of course, all of the canal toll money went to New York State. And that was a tremendous economic boon for the state, both in terms of the state government itself, something in the range of 60 or 70 percent of state expenses were actually paid for by canal tolls. But all that money was invested in the local banks, which were able to use that money, sort of send it out into the local communities. And so it had a tremendous financial impact in terms of that. Plus, all of the the financial efforts to raise the money. There were canal bonds that were sold and lots of folks bought canal bonds. And so it made Wall Street actually an important part of New York State. Wall Street got its start with the funding for the Erie Canal. And those things might not have happened. There would have been a different financial underpinning. Perhaps the tolls would have gone to the federal government. Um, Perhaps New York State in terms of Wall Street would have developed differently. There was also a lot of competition between Virginia and New York about who was going to get that east-west route to the interior of the country. And so perhaps with federal funding on interior improvements and transportation improvements, there might have been some competition with Virginia. Instead of Virginia having to fund it themselves, if the federal government was going to fund it, there might have been something going on there. So my guess is that it still would have happened but it would probably not have had such a dramatic effect. The New York State Canal System was the largest and most ambitious public works project ever undertaken by a single state. And if it had been helped by the federal government, things might have developed differently. I never really considered how the Erie Canal played a role in a citizen's affiliation with New York State and how they thought of New York State. It absolutely connected the state together. Even today, a majority of the New York State population lives within two miles of the canal system. So, and it lasted, you know, the canal lasted for 100 years. And not only did people live physically close to the canal, but the number of people whose occupations actually involved the canal, both in terms of the canal boats or who had businesses along the canal, taverns or hotels, or who were employed in maintaining the canal. Uh, the canal was drained every winter, and there was a whole crew of people that cleared out the canal. So a huge proportion of the population of of New York State actually made a living in some way connected to the canal. So yes, it was a tremendous unifying force for the state as well as the country. Well, Janice, I think you have accomplished your goal. Your descriptions have left us very excited about the Erie Canal and the Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site. Would you tell us if the site has any special events or activities planned? We do. We have a regular series of special events. Our biggest event is an event we call Canal Days. And as the name indicates, it's a kind of canal festival, community festival. Um, We have demonstrations and music and food and wagon rides and all kinds of activities. And that happens on July 11th and 12th. It's usually the second weekend of the year. Uh, We also have a number of other activities that take advantage of the site. we have uh, trails, National Trails Day, which happens on June 6th, and we have guided walks and kayak trips and biking. Uh, we have an annual Mule Hall foot race. We have storytelling on Sundays in August. We have an Erie Canal birthday bash in October. 
One interesting thing that actually isn't even related to the canal, but it's a really cool thing, is back oh, two or three years ago, Hurricane Irene sort of destroyed a lot of the area around the site. It didn't impact any of the canal structures, but it took out roads and the whole town of Fort Hunter was underwater. And when the, fort, the floodwaters receded, we were left with the remains of old 18th century Fort Hunter, which is a fort that was built by the British uh, in 1712. And the fort uh, was uncovered basically by the flood. And we had a team of archaeologists working here to excavate that site. And the archaeologist who did the work is going to give a lecture here and talk about the artifacts that he uncovered on May 26th. So there's going to be an interesting lecture on archaeology here, uh, unrelated to the canal. Uh, so we have lots of activities, and you can find those activities on our Facebook site or on the park's webpage if you want more information, or certainly call or drop us a line. And where is the best place to look for more information about Schoharie's Crossing State Historic Site and about how to plan our visit to Fort Hunter? Um, two, two or three places. Uh, we have an active Facebook page. So for folks who have active on Facebook, uh, look for Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site. That's probably the best place. And then New York State Parks has a web page, which is nysparks.com. And once you get to the parks web page, you can find Schoharie Crossing pretty easily. And our events are listed there as well. Or you can drop us a line directly. Uh, our email address is Crossing at parks.ny.com. Gov. Uh, so those are good places to find out what's happening and to help folks plan their visit here. And I'll place links into the show notes page for this episode so people won't even have to hunt for them. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Janice, for talking about the Erie Canal and telling us all about the Schoharie Crossing historic site. Thanks for the opportunity. I love to talk about the site. The Erie Canal traversed 363 miles of New York State, but it did more than just unite New York. The Erie Canal united the nation. Settlers could move into the Ohio Valley and the Old Northwest Territory, understanding that they would be connected to the East. And that was a big deal. Of course, as Janice mentioned, we shouldn't necessarily envision people taking a leisurely voyage across New York State on canal boats, as the romantic period of passenger canal traffic proved short-lived as railroads and steamboats continued to develop and get faster and more reliable. You can find more information about Janus, the Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash 028. Have you told your friends, family, and fellow history lovers about Ben Franklin's World? The best way to help keep Ben Franklin's World visible and findable to our fellow history lovers is by word of mouth. So please take an opportunity today to tell someone about our podcast. Finally, passenger railroads, steamboats, or stump pullers. What do you think was the most impactful technological development to come out of the construction of the Erie Canal and why? Email me your answers, liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.